Um, my name is Barry Loveland. I'm here with Ashley Formulero and Tessa Burns, who are assisting with the interview as, as videographers and uh, assisting. And we're here on behalf of the LGBT Center of Central Pennsylvania History Project. Today's date is July 30th, 2018, and we're here for an oral history interview with Cecilia Wambach. This interview is taking place at the home of Paul Wambach in Harrisburg. And Cecilia, do we have your permission to record the interview today? Yes, definitely. Great. We have a consent form that we'll have you read over at the end of the interview, and you can okay. uh, read and then sign that. Um, and uh, I know you also go by Sissy, and I didn't know if you wanted to be... Uh, uh, definitely Cecilia. Cecilia, okay. Yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> Although good. Although my family calls me yes, Cecilia. Yeah, very good. Uh, so please, uh, first of all, say and spell your name for the transcript. Okay, my name is Cecilia Wambach, C-E-C-E-L-I-A-W-A-M-B-A-C-H. Great. And what is the date of your birth and location of your birth? Uh, May 26, 1942, and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Okay, great. Um, so what I'd like to start out with is just talk a little bit about um, your very early years growing up in your family and talk maybe about your family um, as, along the way, and, uh, and then we'll get into maybe school and things like that. But start out with your... Okay, my very years. early years... Uh, were interesting because I'm the second oldest of 14 children. Um, and But I was brought up in first a small family, which just grew and grew and grew. And um, it was a very loving family, a very happy family. We did a lot of singing uh, together. Um, I had a father who was very popular here in Pennsylvania, and so we had a lot of opportunities to be on his radio show and his television shows, and um, it basically was a lot of fun being a part of this great big giant family. Um, in my early years as a person, I was very spiritual. We were raised as Catholics, and... Um, I was one of these kids who had a, a very, very close relationship with my guardian angel. And um, I just, um, I was very happy. I was very gregarious. I was a very bright student um, as a little girl. I loved school. Um, my mother taught us to love each baby as each baby came along, and um, we weren't deprived being in this big family at all. I mean, I'm not talking about financially, because we did have things like hand-me-downs and that sort of thing, but um, we considered um, each birth a real gift, and um, the naming of the child was very important, and uh, we had responsibility for one another. Actually, Paul was my first baby. I was five years old, and I used to buggy him down the street. And Paul was a twin, and Patty was a year older than I was, and Peter was her first baby. And so I remember my early childhood as um, very happy, very special. We had an extended, large Zarbo family. Um, my mother's uh, sisters and brother were uh, also in this area of, uh, in Pennsylvania. And so um, it's a very unusual upbringing. I don't have any of this junk like a lot of other uh, people have that I know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably... What, uh, in terms of your schools, what schools oh, did schools, you go to? Oh, uh, schools. We went to Catholic school. And um, I attended first St. Patrick's, then St. Margaret Mary's, it was elementary school. And um, I was a very fun-loving, I was a bright student, but I was also a bit of a hellraiser in um, seventh and eighth grade. I had this, um, I was part of this girl gang, you know, we had, um, 
We had a lot of fun. We were very mischievous, especially in high school. Um, and uh, for high school, I went to Bishop McDevitt. I was very active in... Um, I was an artist. I'm still an artist. And um, I was very, very active in speech. I did um, declamations and um, original oratory and debate. And um, <clears throat> that was really fun for me, so I excelled in that area. And um, uh, it was really, I loved McDevitt. It was, um, I had very good friends there. I have very good memories. I was, uh, I always hung out with the um, girls who were hanging out with the nuns. And I was very uh, girl, woman identified but I thought that that meant that I had a vocation to the religious life. And so, you know, there were um, large groups of girls that hung out together, and I was one of them. Um, and, um, and in high school, the one hard thing for me is that, for some reason, um, I, I knew I wasn't like the other girls because I... I didn't have a boyfriend. I couldn't really know how to get a boyfriend. And I knew as a young woman that's what you were supposed to do. And it was very hard for me because I didn't quite know what was wrong with me. And I figured I must have had a vocation to the religious life. Um, and my sister was dating my older sister. Um, and um, let me see what else about I, I actually finally um, finished my education um, and got my PhD in mathematics education. But, uh, but in high school, I was more in English, speech, and, um, and art. And so uh, that's about it. Did you have any? Uh, did you do any uh, sports or any special activities? Uh, no, or girls. Like girls really didn't do sports. Back then, I yes. mean, I am seventy-six years old, and so we. You could be a cheerleader, but it was mostly the girly girls that were cheerleaders, and um, and you know the girl. No, we didn't have really anything for the girls. Um, not even a girls' basketball team. There was nothing. And so I was very um, spirited. I would go to all the games and scream and yell for the boys, and that's the way it was. Um, no, no sports at all for the girls. And I, I actually, to tell you the truth, I was never into sports. Like I had one partner um, back in the early days, and she like loved to play hop along Cassidy. Then no, 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 I was not a tomboy at all. No, I was a different kind of. Um, yeah, I was constantly trying to look better, be prettier, because that's what you were supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you have any sense of your uh, attraction to girls at that point, or was that still something that you didn't really resolve until later? Um, yes, now in hindsight, I see that I did have attraction to girls because I was hanging out with these very good girlfriends and I was very very close to them and um, but none of them actually grew up to be a lesbian interestingly enough um, and I I uh, I had a I definitely had attraction to different nuns like this nun sister Gil Mary I was very attracted to her but she was my English teacher, and I loved poetry, and she introduced me to poetry. And so, um, so I think that that may have also been the connection. I never heard the word lesbian. Um, I didn't know that there were any gay folks at all. As a matter of fact, it was only later on that I heard about gay men, and I, I heard about them before I even heard about gay women. You know, and so um, there, there was no indication of that at all, except that I did go to my Aunt Teresa's house to, um, for the summer to help take care of her kids. 
and um, there was a woman, uh, a woman named Pat. There was this volleyball team, and the neighbor girl, Pat, who was a couple years older than I, wanted me to come and play volleyball. And there was something very exciting to me about Pat and her friends. And, I, and, and my aunt wanted me to hang out with this other woman, and I said, I like them. She was saying, no, no, you can't be around them. They're weird. And I was saying, what do you mean? I, had, I still had no idea, and they were actually a group of young lesbians. But that was, that was it. I, now I know that. You know, and I talked to my aunt about that at my last family reunion. She was saying, yeah, well, they were lesbians, and I didn't want you to hang out with them. And I said, why? I'm a lesbian. And she said, oh, don't say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, I think that, no, no, I didn't have, um, well, I did. I did have a, your question was about attraction to um, lesbian. So just my girlfriends and yeah, yeah, but nothing sexual, nothing, no. Right. right. More emotional yeah. and um, and those kinds of connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit more about your uh, father, since your father was kind of a famous figure in yes. Pennsylvania, and and also about your mother. Just to yes. Some background. Well, my father, first of all. I was madly in love with my father. My father and I were twin souls. Um, he was just a beautiful father. He was loving and charismatic and caring. Um, he loved his big family. He loved my mother. He was very demonstrative. He would dance around the living room with my mother. And um, and so and interestingly enough, my mother was entirely different. She was a typical Sicilian, and my father would take her to Rome, and he would sit in the carriage with her in Rome and play the flute for her, and she would say, "Pete," you know, she was that type. She, um, and he would say, "I love you, Margarita Carmela," and she would say, "Pete, the kids need shoes," you know. They were total opposites. And I was actually much closer to my father than I was to my mother. And um, it, that's, that was interesting because I really spent a long time with my mother. I retired and came because my mother was dying. And I spent a long time with my mother really growing to love her at the end of her life. Um, I thought that she was negative, and um, she was so different from me. I, I had my father's spirit, and I couldn't, you know, she had these Sicilian sayings that she would say to us, and they were negative things, you know. And she would always, um, she could look at someone, and she could, she, she could tell me, the negative things about them. Meanwhile, everyone thought my mother was a saint. I thought she was a saint too. She raised all these kids. She cooked. She, she cleaned. She and she went along. She loved my father, and she went along with every, all of his ideas. And he told me a lot of his ideas were mom's ideas. And but in terms of my relationship with them, um, I was closer to my father than I was to my mother. And interestingly enough. A lot of my lesbian friends are closer to their fathers. And a lot of gay men are very close to their mothers. So I wonder if there's some kind of thing about that. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But, um, but um, they were, my father was, I thought my father was famous, you know, um, because he was a big shot in this little city. And I love that he was famous. I was very proud of him. And he taught us how to sing together. And that is something I cherish. I mean, even at the university in my math classes, I sang with my students. Um, I have singing in me as a part of how I live my life. And I owe that to my father. My mother loved to sing too, though. You know, we all sang together. And it was, uh, it was that was wonderful. And my mother, my mother, there is this, 
there is this quality that, as Catholics, you're, you're taught these the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And one of these gifts is called long-suffering. And my mother had this thing, this, this, this quality called long-suffering, which is that she had this very, very large family. She worked and worked with each of us. And, you know, she raised us and she cleaned and cooked. I mean, she never had any help. She sewed. She sewed our clothes. And I mean, she, um, she was amazing as a mother, as a, as a caregiver and in terms of the arts of the home. And, um, but I'm telling you, I don't know how she did it. The only thing I can think of is she had long suffering. She would always, she would do everything that she did with pleasure, really. Um, and, and she acted her whole life as if she loved this life that she had. And I couldn't figure that one out until the end of her life when she told me, you know what? I did love it. <laughs> So, um, so she was a she was a good, solid, good Italian woman, a great partner for my father. And my father was one of these. He had a million ideas, and he could actualize his ideas. And um, I learned from him. I have a million ideas too, and I lived my life um, really being able to actualize the ideas I had. And I think that's because of my father. And he was a broadcaster He uh, was everything. He right? was a broadcaster, yeah. radio personality, a television personality during the early days of television. He was also speech writer for many of the governors. He was press secretary of Pennsylvania for many years. He was leader of the Democratic Party. He was very progressive. And he always went to all of the, um, oh gosh, what do they call these things? They have these presidential, the places where they nominate the Convention. president. The, the conventions. Yeah. He was a delegate to many, many conventions. And he was also a lover of Pennsylvania. And so he had a radio show called This is Pennsylvania. It was broadcast, it was only a three minute long show, broadcast five times a day on many, many stations in Pennsylvania. And it was a lovely show. It was about these little towns and hamlets of Pennsylvania. It was about characters uh, who were a part of Pennsylvania's history. Um, and, um, and I think that for me, that was his capstone, this is Pennsylvania. But he also had um, a news newspaper column, a daily newspaper column called Around the Square with Pete Wambach that ran for over 50 years. And he was the first man ever in the whole United States to have an evening talk show. Uh, and it was here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And they wanted him to come to New York City to do it. And my parents decided no. They couldn't move out of Harrisburg. But um, then gradually, other people started to pick up this um, this idea of the evening talk show. And he had his regulars, his, he used to call them his crazies. Like there was someone who used to call into his show all the time and say that she thought that the cows and horses should be wearing underwear out on the <laughs> And she was a part of his show. You know, he had his regulars, his Esperanto history people who were trying to um, build up Esperanto as the international language. So, um, I, you know, he had, he had this amazing evening radio show. Um, and um, he also had the quotation, um, which was always on his radio show, it's a beautiful day in Pennsylvania. And, um, and he was so positive. He really always thought he could always find something about this city, this, this place he loved, and Philadelphia, his birthplace, and Pennsylvania, his homeland. He loved it. He loved it. And it was a beautiful day in Pennsylvania for him. Yeah, he was a great man. He was a great father. 
and um, yeah. Great. Thank you for asking about him. So talk a little bit more about um, sort of after once you graduated now from high from school. High school. Yeah. What did you? How did you make the decision for the next step in your life? Well, um, well, I was talking earlier to the women who are assisting you about this, and I actually went into the convent, and I think that because I was so women-identified and so um, I, I guess I just, um, you know, I liked women a lot and, and also I was a very spiritual person. I was religious. I, um, I loved the Gregorian chants and uh, um, I was in the choir when I was a girl and I loved God and um, and I was a believer, a great big giant believer, as a matter of fact. And, and I actually still am. And even though I'm not a churchgoer, or I wouldn't even consider myself a Catholic, except that I'm a follower of Roman Catholic women priests. But as a human being, I'm a spiritual, religious being. And um, so I entered the convent. And I entered the School Sisters of Notre Dame, and they were a teaching order and I was interested in being a teacher. And so I went with 50 other young women in 1960 to Baltimore, Maryland, to the mother house and, and entered the religious life where I lived for the next 10 years with a lot of uh, women, yeah, in a completely uh, female society. And uh, it was wonderful. I loved it, actually. It was fun. It was wonderful. I never, uh, I have heard, I've read the books about lesbian nuns. As a matter of fact, I know the woman who wrote um, Breaking Silence, the story of lesbian nuns, but I never actually knew any lesbian nuns when I was in the convent. It's true. And I never, you know, I don't know if I was latent, sexually late. I don't know what I was, but... I didn't actually know that there were um, women who were lesbians in the convent. Uh, I was not, uh, but I was enjoying my teaching, my other, the friends I made there, and and I stayed for ten years. I got my uh, bachelor's degree at our college, Notre Dame of Maryland College. I majored in English and art. I had a double major. Mm, following my high school leanings, and um, and and that was it. It was a lovely, wonderful life. I was in many different houses. I was in Baltimore, Maryland. I was in Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania, beautiful parish there, and I was in Ver Fairfax, Virginia, where um, I had my first love affair with the uh, pastor <laughs> and that's why I left the convent. <laughs> I broke my vows oh god I shouldn't probably have said it on tape but whatever you know I still did not know that that I was a lesbian yeah well, for those 10 years mm. So did you have like teaching assignments that you would go at a, to a school and teach or yes, like you Catholic would, schools or I would I would go into a parish. And so I was in the parish of St. Jerome's in Baltimore, Maryland first. I lived there for a year and I taught in the school in that parish. I lived in the convent there. Then I went to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia to another parish and I lived there for a year. And then I went to, um, I think I went to, yeah, I went to St. Jerome's. Did I, I don't think did I mention St. Jerome's? I don't sure. think so. Yeah, I went to St. Jerome's for, I think, two years. And then after that, I went to, um, I went to St. Leo's in Fairfax, Virginia. And so I was for five or six, I, I guess for seven years, I was in different houses with different nuns. And I became very close friends with all of them and just enjoyed convent life a lot. 
and uh, teaching in the Catholic schools. I enjoyed that. It was really fun. And, um, and so I was really living um, a life uh, with all women, but I was teaching in Catholic schools mostly with teachers who were all women and um, teaching in elementary school. And so I mostly taught 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grades um, in these Catholic schools. Yeah. And, and it was a rich and um, fulfilling life. And I was learning how to teach as I went along because I never majored in education. I majored in art and English, but it was really fun. We would, we would teach in the school and then at night we'd come home and the old nuns would look at our plans and they would assist us and we would plan out our next day and we would go in the next day and teach and come home and plan. I mean, that's what it was. It was about, it was about teaching and I grew to love teaching and I grew to love other teachers and I grew to realize that if you teach, you are really um, developing, you're really helping to raise the next generation. I mean, I really, really believed in teaching. It was great um, because, because I believed in children. Yeah, I've always loved children. My mother taught me to love children. Yeah. Good. Um, and uh, you mentioned the priests that you... Oh, felt. Father Malloy. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, talk the a pastor. More about that. The priest. I fell in love with the priest. And I had an affair with him, and I mean, I had an evening with him, and I decided I broke my vow of chastity, and I had to leave the convent. And I was shocked that he wasn't going to leave the priesthood, interestingly enough. I was so surprised. <laughs> but anyway, I did leave, and, um, <clears throat> and after I left, I decided, oh my God, I've got to go find my man. This is what you have to do, and so I did. I found my man. He was an ex-priest, and um, it was uh, he was actually an ex-seminarian. He never actually became a priest himself, but I went to New York City. I had a friend who was an ex-nun, and she said, I have a job for you. I mean, there were so many jobs. There were jobs galore, and, you know, it was, an, it was a very interesting time because it was the time of... Um, Dr. Martin Luther King, there was a civil rights movement. I worked with him as a nun. So the early 60s then? Uh, this is the, yeah, this is the 60s yeah. and early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and I even went to, I even went, I even heard his I Have a Dream speech when I was in the convent. I had to, I was in a speech class and we had to go hear this man give a speech. And I had to go on the bus with all these other women in the class. I was in the Notre Dame of Maryland College. And I went on the bus. Um, and I heard this man give a speech. It was Dr. Martin Luther King. I had never heard of him. But then I became very, very interested in the black community and in working with him. And, and I was a volunteer with him um, for a number of years, which was really wonderful. I was in uh, Baltimore in Fairfax, Virginia, and he was in Washington, D.C. So after the Poor People's Campaign, I, I volunteered with him. And so I had this other life going on, too. I had this activism life happening, uh, which was great because um, I also met my ex-husband at a, a place for at a club for ex-nuns and ex-priests called Bearings, where you can get your bearings after leaving the, everyone was leaving the convent. Mm -hmm. You know, we were also anti-war uh, demonstrators and protesters. We were working to get us out of the Vietnam War, and he was, he was working with uh, Phil and Daniel Berrigan, the Berrigan brothers, and I was marching, and we met one another in this club, and we were, uh, activists, and so we f we fell in love with one another because of um, those reasons, probably, and um, and I married him, and we had this one lovely boy, Nathaniel, who's my 
the love of my life today, my son, and um, and he's a good, charismatic, caring, bright man who's a great father, and um, and I raised him, and I'm very proud of that. That's probably one of the best things I ever did in my life because of the kind of man he is. And he knew how to choose a woman that was a wonderful human being. And he knew how to love her. And, and that's a great thing that I did in my life. And, you know, lesbians raise great sons. Uh, after I left my husband, I belonged to Dykes and Tykes in New York City. And, um, and I actually am very good friends with a woman who founded that group, Carol Morton. She now lives in San Francisco. And, but this was in New York. I lived in New York and taught in the New York City public schools and raised my son. And um, I just, um, I, had a, I had a wonderful life bringing him up and teaching in the New York City public schools. And so, I don't know, do you want me to continue on yeah. just chronologically? Yeah, talk a little bit more <clears throat> about uh, your experiences when you were married and, and uh, what what made you decide at that point that the, it was the end of marriage? Or Yeah. Well, do you know that, oh gosh, I hope Joe never sees this <laughs> film, but he probably won't. But the day after I got married, I realized I was a lesbian. How? I will never know. Okay. Okay. Okay, so probably the day after I got married, I realized that I was a lesbian. Definitely. And I said, oh my God. Yes. Oh my God. I knew about lesbians at that point. I. I don't know how I figured it out, but I got married and I said, oh my God, yes, this is who I am. It was like a neon sign flashing on and I was saying, stop, wait, <laughs> help, no, go away. And I was turning around and running as fast as I could the other way. And I was saying, okay, I'm going to make this work. I, I can do this. I've done other things before. I know how to do this life and I want to be married. This is who I want to be. And um, and I really fought it. I really fought it. I actually stayed in the marriage for 10 years, but I was not faithful in that marriage. And so I started try experimenting and trying to figure it out. So I had my son. I was a young mother. I loved it. It was really fun. I liked the other mothers. They were great. We all hung out with our kids and talked about them and how was this developing and that developing. It, it was fun. And my sisters had children, and so I was, they were really happy that I had a child, and so that part was very, very good. But I still knew in the back of my mind who I was. I did. Then, I, when I got pregnant, I stopped teaching in the New York City, for the New York City Public Schools because I had a number of miscarriages and I realized before my son was born and I realized that that work was too strenuous for me to carry a child. And so I stayed at home for a while and I had a child and then I, and I applied for a job teaching at Felician College in Lodi, New Jersey. And it was a small women's college and um, it was run by the Felician nuns, and I said, this would be the perfect job for me. So I began teaching there. I was like practically the whole education department. I mean, I taught everything. And by that time, actually, I should back up because I had taught in the New York City public schools, and I had become their, their, uh, the math supervisor of District 13 in Brooklyn, and... I did that back, back, I have to back up a little bit. I got my um, master's in math from New York University. Then I got my master's in fine arts painting from New York University. And I mean, I was just, and then I got my PhD in math education from Fordham University. So 
So while I was living in New York City and after the convent, I was doing all this education stuff. I was just kept going and, you know, I was always interested and loved education, the university. I loved that life. I loved living my life and learning also. I'm a lifelong learner. And so um, I, and then, um, and not and then, simultaneously, you know, I was, I was uh, throwing rocks in the windows of Loeb Center at NYU with all the people, <laughs> you know, we were protesting the Vietnam War. I was doing that. I was raising my child. I was getting my master's. I was getting my PhD. I was uh, being a mother and, okay. So then I go to Felician College and I see these women and I say, whoa, they they fascinate me. So I said to this one nun, Sister Aquinas, those women, who are they? They're so fascinating. She says, mm, stay away from them. Just like my Aunt Teresa. <laughs> stay away from them. Why? You don't know? They're lesbians. Oh, my God, they're lesbians? Really? Huh. I wonder what they're about. She says, stay away from them. You're a happily married woman. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll stay away from them. So I secretly started to befriend these students, and there were a couple of professors that were, like, in with them. So then there was this singer, Chris Williamson, and she was singing these wonderful songs. She had this, this was the first lesbian fabulous album, The Changer and the Changed. And we had our women's music, which was so fabulous. I can't tell you because, um, born of the earth, child of God. And I, I mean, she was a lesbian like I was a lesbian. She was a child of God. She was born of the earth. And uh, her things, her songs, the lyrics were about caring for people and counting on, you can count on me to share the load. I mean, the lyrics were so wonderful. And lesbians, we were such activists and movers and shakers, and we were taking care of battered women, and we were doing all of this activist work, and nobody even knew we were around. We were doing it quietly. I was even afraid to say the word lesbian. I would go L, she's an L, you know. but. We were very active and in um, social movements. We really were. And um, it's interesting because the young lesbians don't want to even be called lesbians because they don't want to be about that, which is great. I mean, we've evolved. It's, everything's changing. But back then, it was a real activist. We're going to change the world. We're going to save the world. We're going to be there for women and we're going to help battered women, we're going to um, help women get promoted, we're going to help women become doctors and lawyers, have, take their place in the world, we're going to become those women. And um, the lesbians were really at the forefront of the women's movement. Of course, I didn't even know there was a women's movement going on because I was so active in the civil rights movement. So I had a different movement happening, but but anyway, we were there. It was wonderful. It was great. Um, but where am I? Let me see. I'm at Felician College. I'm following these women around. And then I met Sandy Ramos, and Sandy Ramos was the first woman ever to have battered women in her home. She ran this group, SOS, Shelter Our Sisters. And I was, tell, I was saying, you know, I think I'm a lesbian, I'm not sure. And then one of someone, she was a straight woman, she told me, you know what, you should, ah, oh, my friend from graduate school, Dorothy, she said, you ought to call this woman, her name is Sandy Ramos. She lives in Hackensack, New Jersey, and she's a lesbian. She's, she's out there doing things, but she says she's a lesbian out loud. I said, you're kidding me. She said, no. She said, here's her phone number. She gave me her phone number. I called her and I said, I'm afraid to tell you why I'm calling you, I said. And she said, well, why are you calling me? Do you want to, 
are you a battered wife? And I said, no, no, I'm not a battered wife. I said, I'm, I'm married to this very nice man. And she said, well, why? And I said, well, did you ever hear, hear of Chris Williamson? She said, of course. And I said, well, I'm calling you about her. And she said, well, what about her? <laughs> and she said, are you a lesbian? And I said, I'm not sure. And she said, oh, I'd love to meet with you and talk to you. And I told her I was a professor at, at um, this women's college. And so she said, let's meet. And I met with her, and she talked to me. And we, she introduced me to some of her friends. And I said, oh, my god, I'm a lesbian. Now I have to go get a divorce. And so I separated from my husband. And, and then, I mean, everything was crazy. All these women that we were all sleeping with one another, too. That was like a big deal. You know, you didn't really know your friend unless you slept with her. And I'm saying, oy vey, <laughs> Jesus, what am I doing, you know? <laughs> and so, okay, I, um, I, I just, I was so totally mixed up. I started to go to therapy. Yeah, I started to go to therapy and... And that was great. And I was hanging out with these lesbians. I got myself a lesbian girlfriend. Her name was Pat. And she still lives here somewhere. Not here. Where am I? I'm in Harrisburg. Yeah, she lives in New Jersey and um, New York, New Jersey area. And um, so I had my first lesbian partner, but I was still married. And I told her, you know, I have to stay married and we'll be... And she says, that's fine, you know. But then after six months, it wasn't fine. And so she said, you've got to break up with this guy. You know, we've been together six months. And I said, he's my husband. I can't. <laughs> so there, do you know how many stories like this there are? We were all trying to figure it out. And when I think about it, and when I think of the young women today, and they're able to be out and... They know they're lesbians at an early age, and they've heard the word, and they know they're queer. They know they're queer. They know they're different. I knew I was different, too, but I didn't know I was queer. I didn't know I was a lesbian, never heard of the words. And we were figuring it out together, and we were giving ourselves permission to have these girlfriends and these affairs, and we didn't know what we were doing. Um, but we were, this was the early days. This is about this history project. Mm -hmm. This was the early days of trying to figure out who I am, who a lesbian was. I'm married. What am I going to do now? Am I going to be divorced? I don't, my parents are going to be so upset if I get a divorce. No one's divorced in my family. Oh my God, they're going to find out I'm a lesbian. What am I going to do? So all of this was a great big giant deal. And not just when I tell the story to my friends, they have similar stories. And um, these were the early days. We were all, and then after that, we were all in these books about coming, telling our coming out stories, you know. So it was just a different, it was a one, it was actually wonderful but terrible too. And um, I had a lot of guilt and shame because I was raised as a Catholic girl. You know, and there was that devil running after me saying, you're gonna go to hell. You don't, do you wanna go to hell? Okay, divorce your husband and be, and div just divorce your husband, that's the first thing, you're gonna go to hell. I had this inner devil chasing me around my whole darn life. So, um, but I don't have him anymore, thank God. But, um, and I never think of him when I think of my childhood, but he was around then too, so whatever. Um, so, where am I? I'm, I got a divorce. About what year was that, do you remember? <clears throat> Let's see, I got married in 19... 73, so this was now about 1983. Mm -hmm. And um, so everything had happened. Um, yeah, that whole civil rights piece, you know, Martin Luther King was killed, and 
um, RFK was killed, and JFK first. I mean, it was a very, very heavy, serious time. Um, yeah, I got married at 73, and I was married for 10 years, so that was 83. Did you end up coming out to your husband to let him know why? No, no. Oh, God, no. No. I divorced him, and that's a shame that I didn't do that, but I did divorce him. I mean, he knows I'm a lesbian now. I mean, we're in one another's lives now, and, you know, he knows all my friends. They're all lesbians, and he likes them, and... Yeah, you know, we have like this whole California life now, and so it's like, okay, my ex-wife is a lesbian, you know, and it's fine, it's okay. It's very good, actually. Um, and so I, oh no, what happened to me is, okay, Pat told me I had to divorce my husband. She broke up with me. It was a very sad time in my life. I was very sad. I loved her. She was wonderful. And um, and then, but you know, and I had this child, Nathaniel. He was like five or six. Okay, and so we got back together. Joe and I got back together because he called me and he said, my company is moving to California, to San Francisco. Do, Let's get back together. Do you want to get back together? And let's see. And I said, San Francisco? <laughs> Boy, I mean, I didn't know what to say. So I said, okay, come on, let's try it again. So the second I got back together with him, I realized, oh my God, why I divorced him to begin with. It wasn't just about being a lesbian. It was, you know, he was like, um, he was a very controlling guy. And I was, I was like all over the place, you know, I have all these Geminis in my sign. I go flying around the world, I'm an absent-minded professor type. And he is like, uh, you know, this way, holding me down, and boy, I needed that. He was grounding me. So I said, okay, I'll get back together with him, we'll move to California. We did that about a month after I was out, to Cali out in California. I went into the Castro and I said, oh my God, this is fabulous. And I saw in the paper, do you think you're a lesbian? Come to this group. And so I went to this group and um, I began the process of coming out. I went into therapy and it, it, therapy was very big in California. I mean, I was spending so much money on therapy, but it was necessary. I had to do it. I needed help. But I actually began, there were a lot of other helps at that point in the community, too. There was Operation Concern, um, which was uh, in the Castro, and it was for um, uh, gay men and lesbians. There were, there were many, many different groups there to, to help you. Um, uh, it was very, very active time. Harvey Milk, you know, was uh, very active. Um, I was teaching at San Francisco S State. One of my good friends was Sally Gerhardt. She was like uh, the first out lesbian in any university anywhere. And um, I had a lot of good lesbian friends who taught at San Francisco State. And I was hired right away at San Francisco State. And I was saying to my therapist, you know, I don't know any lesbians. She said, you're teaching at San Francisco State. And I said, yeah, but I can't tell who's a lesbian and who isn't. And she said, well, you know, I'll give you the names of some of them and call them up. And so Sally Gerhardt was one of them. Corky Wick was another. She was one of the founding mothers of Mother Tongue. She's currently one of my best friends today. And so I met a lot of wonderful women. It was a wonderful women's community. We were um, very, very instrumental in working for AIDS. I was a volunteer in Shanti Project, um, which was a big, um, you know, the lesbians in San Francisco at least, we were very, very active in the um, working for AIDS community. I was not actually a part of ACT OUT, but I was on the sidelines cheering for ACT OUT. I did a couple of lesbian avenger things, you know, we would put um, 
these um, bandanas on our face and go into the gay bars and say, stick them up for AIDS, you know, and uh, with these play pistols. And um, that was, we were trying to raise money for AIDS uh, research. And so I was active in that community, and um, I was very active for 30 years at San Francisco State um, in the um, mathematics education community and in the education community and in the public schools of San Francisco. And I was an out lesbian, which was, which was great. I mean, how did I jump? At first, I wasn't out in my department interesting until I got tenure they told me these other women they said look they're giving a lot of lesbians tenure and you know you may not be one of them you know because you have a very your department at the education department they're very conservative which was interesting because I didn't see my department as at all conservative but they said yeah they're very conservative they didn't strike with us and I wasn't there during the big strike and so I said, okay, you know, and I didn't actually come out until I got tenure. And then I got tenure and I um, uh, came out and, um, and everyone was very happy that I was a lesbian. There was a gay man in the department too. His name was Rob Moore. He was a very, very loved professor. He actually, um, he was an early childhood professor. And so we were the team. We were the gay and lesbian team in the department. And we had all these gay men coming into elementary school teaching and all these lesbians coming into like high school math and science. You know, it was interesting. A very, very interesting group of um, men and lesbian and gay men and women coming into teaching and um, we were advisors to them which was very very fun and I remember one of my students Timothy Fallon Fike one of the most brilliant education students I had who died of AIDS by the way and um, he he came to me and he said what am I gonna do he said, I'm a teacher in this school. And he said, I, I, I need to have a picture of my wife sitting on my desk. You know, he was scared to be out in his school because he was working with young children. And there was all this junk about young children, even though Tom Amiano, he was like very, very strong in working for, you know, his partner was an elementary school teacher, a dear friend of mine. But anyway... Um, so we had all these gay men in elementary schools and they wanted to come out. I remember marching in the gay parade with the gay teachers. I was working at the, uh, in the university so I could march, but on the sidelines were all these elementary school teachers waving to me because they couldn't be in the parade because they couldn't be out. These gay men, because they're gonna ruin these little kids and they were just such beautiful teachers. You know, and, um, but I was really there for them, you know, and, um, yeah, and I, and by the way, I, Timothy, so I said to Timothy, you won't believe what I did. I arranged for Timothy to marry this woman from Holland who had to get married to stay in this country because she had a partner, she was a lesbian, and her partner had to, um, she wanted to stay here. So they had to get married. So I, I introduced him to her. I said, whoa, this is a, a gift. You can get married to one another. And they did, they got married. And I'm telling you, they were followed by the, by the immigration people, you know. But anyway, um, so he had her picture sitting on his desk. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, you know, and then eventually, Timothy, his partner got AIDS, and then Timothy died of AIDS. I mean, it was unbelievable. All these gay, young gay teachers were dying of AIDS, all of my students. 
So I was a friend of Cleve Jones. He started this project, the Names Project. And I was actually one of the first persons who, um, who made, an, who made an, a, a quilt because I needed to help Timothy heal because his partner, they didn't even recognize him at the funeral. You know, he was buried in the Unitarian Church of San Francisco and he had a family. He had been married, but he was divorced. So his family was all at the funeral, but Timothy couldn't really be a part of his family and they were even living together. So I, um, I went with Timothy to make a names project quilt for his partner because it was very much, you know, we made these great big giant quilts and you sewed them, you know, you didn't glue them together. And it was a whole process of healing and sewing. It was like being in the artistic process. And so my sister Rita called me. This is, I'm telling this story because this is a Harrisburg story. My sister Rita called me and she said that her, fr her friend, she was, the, she was a flower girl in these people's wedding. Their last name was Tusi. And she said, you know, their son just died of AIDS, but they don't know it. They think he died of cancer. And he called himself Joe Tucci. He went by the Italian name. I said, you're kidding me. Someone should tell them that he died of AIDS. And she said, oh, it'd kill them. They don't even know he was gay. And I said, are you sure he was gay? He said, he was definitely gay. He had a partner and everything. And so I made a quilt for Joe Tucci. One of the first quilts that was made was for him. And I said, I don't know you, and you don't know me, but I'm a hidden gay girl from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and you're a hidden gay boy from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and I'm making this quilt to honor you. And that quilt, I went to Washington to the first laying out of the quilt. You know, we had this whole thing we laid it out and we put it on the Capitol lawn and and Joe Tucci's quilt made by me and also Timothy Timothy went with me we went together he brought his partner's quilt I brought that quilt I mean they were all sewn together at that point but we unfolded we were part of the people who unfolded the quilt in Washington and Joe Tucci's quilt is in the first book of the Names Project. You know, the, the, they put out a book of the yeah. quilts, and his quilt is in there, made by me. And I was so scared that my parents were going to, or his parents, were going to get this quilt book. I mean, I don't know what I thought. <laughs> they weren't going to go to the bookstore and buy that book. But I was so scared that, you know, my family would f find out, and his family. You know, my brothers and sisters knew I was a lesbian, but my parents didn't. And so, but I guess I should just jump to there. When I finally told my parents, they were wonderful. They were thrilled. Well, first my father said, no, you're women identified. I said, how the heck does he know that term? He said, you're not a lesbian, you're women identified. And he said, I knew it the day you entered the convent. I said, Dad, you know, that was 20 years ago. He said, yeah, I knew it the day you married your husband. I said, what? And he said, yeah, you're women identified. And I said, what's that? And he says, well, you know, they're writing about it. They're writing about these women identified women. Sure enough, he was right. You know, he had done his research. And, um, and I said, no, I'm actually a lesbian, you know. And so he... Um, you know, and I told him, I sat down with them. They were lovely, lovely. They were loving, they were, they were lovely, you know. So anyway, and you, very you had, accepting. Uh, you had come out to uh, some of your siblings before that? Yes, yeah. yeah. Who, who was it first that you started with? First, I think, probably Rita. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prob probably Rita. Uh, I think I'm actually closest two of my older brothers and oh well my sister Patty was still living my sister Patty died of a brain aneurysm um, very suddenly 
but probably Patty and Rita, and then probably um, those, the in-betweens, probably Peter, Paul, Vinny, and Joe, probably that. We have like two um, generations in our family. We have, you know, the, the seven oldest, and then three years space, and then the seven youngest, and so probably the oldest, and then... Uh, and then I think everybody just knew. Everybody told everybody. Yeah. How, how were the reactions from your siblings? Loving and fabulous. They were thrilled. They were thrilled because my family has all, always had a whole bunch of gay men in their lives. We're like, you know, um, for some reason, we've always had a lot of gay men in our lives. Yeah, because gay men are very nice. You know, I love gay men. And um, and I have a lot of gay men friends now, you know, and I love them. They're very artistic and clever and creative and brilliant, you know, and they generally all have a, something they're an expert in, you know. So, and I like that way of being, and so, yeah. And I think my cousin, well, my cousin Chipper is gay, and he's a very loved cousin. And he's one of the Zarbos. We just had our Zarbo family reunion. My mother had one brother and four sisters, and we're the Zarbos, and the Wombacks are one branch. And so my uncle Angelo had this son, Chipper, and he was one of my favorite cousins, and he was a gay man, and just a lovely, wonderful man. And so, but we're the only two so far. Yeah. So we don't know, you know. But I'm sort of losing uh, track of where I am. I think I'm all over the place. Uh, well, um, I think we talked about um, uh, San Francisco, that uh, you were active in the community out there. Yes. Uh, especially during the AIDS crisis. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sort of post-AIDS, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, what, um, what your life was like in San Francisco after that. Yeah, my life in San Francisco... Um, I went actually, I had a long-term 10-year um, uh, relationship with my first partner, Alexa, and she was a professor at City College, and so there were all these different groups of lesbians, and so there were the academic lesbians, and so I was in that group, um, and there were the, um, then there were the, uh, what do they call themselves? Olock. They were the old ladies. And they're, they're now old lesbians organizing for change. They've become a national movement. But they started out at the, as these old ladies from um, Operation Concern. And they had a senior group. And this, this senior group, men and women, there were a lot of really great, like John DiCecco. I don't know if you know that name, but he was a a gay professor from San Francisco State, and he did a lot of the early academic work on gays and lesbians. And Monica, Monica, what the heck was it? Monica Kehoe, she did a lot of the early work on older lesbians. But anyway, they formed, they formed this group. These old ladies, I mean, you can't imagine, they were all, they were like, <laughs> oh my God, they were, um, well, they dressed, they looked like old, uh, you know, they dressed in like uh, old raggedy clothes. They were sort of downwardly mobile looking. They looked, you know, they had hairs on their chin, 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 and they, um, they were geezers. They were these old lady geezers, and there was this whole group of them, and they hung out together. They were very activism oriented, and they were... Um, and they were very, they liked being, they, they were, their part, they, they were butch femme, all of them. You know, they had that old model way of being, and um, they were fun. There was this one, Janie McHarg, and she wrote a lot of old, she wrote a lot of these old songs and sang them and banged on the piano, and, and they played the gut bucket, and, you know, they were... I don't know. I wish I had a good name to describe these gals. I can just describe them as old geezers. But the one thing 
that they did was they started this group, OLOC, Old Lesbians Organizing for Change. And the academic lesbians looked at them and said, ha, 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 you know, and the, the um, uh, lesbian, lipstick lesbians, they were from Bay Area career women, you know, everybody all dolled up and all like hot looking and everything with high heels and that whole group. There were all these different groups. It was a very colorful community. And at BACW used to have Bay Area career women. They had a kind of a prom called Putting on the Ritz during Gay Pride. And and everybody came looking their different ways, you know, but there were all these like gorgeous dressed up women. Then there were the women who all wear tuxedos. You know, they were all women thinking they were they were men kind of thing. So there were all these kind of little groups and I was in the academic lesbian group and I was also because um, I was also a part of BACW because my partner was the president of BACW, Bay Area Career Women. They were all these business women. They were all about networking. But these old ladies, they were, they were wonderful. And my friend, Cheryl Goldberg, was in charge of these old ladies at Operation Concern. She was the director and she used to run these tea dances. She used to say, come on, come to the tea dances, you know, for these old lesbians. And they were wonderful. A lot of them had been in the military and they were very, very, they were very butch and very dyke and very, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna hang out with any of these people who think they're lesbians who were married once, okay? They're not lesbians, they're not the true lesbians. That's us, you know, these old gals. But they started this OLOC, and this OLOC has become a national movement, Old Lesbians Organizing for Change. And those old lesbians that started that were just a whole motley crew, a lovely, lovely, wonderful, I, they wouldn't want to be called lovely, but a group of characters, characters. And um, I think we owe a lot to them. But the community, you also had, oh, we had all these bars in San Francisco. So you had your bar girls and your pool playing girls, your flannel shirt girls. Everybody was different. You know, they were all, everyone had their own uniform and they were all in these different groups. And so I was in the, um, the academic group, but I kind of, I liked hanging out with all the groups, you know, once a wombat, always a wombat, you know, and so... <laughs> So I sort of, you know, I was in BACW and I liked the OLOC ladies. I went to the tea dance and, you know, I sort of, um, yeah, did the whole thing. But then I broke up with Alexa and I said, never again, because she was a very, she was very strict. She was a lot like my ex-husband and she was very strict with my son. And I was trying to raise my son to be a caring, loving kid. But he was a lot like me, which is sort of like flying around everywhere. He was a creative, sort of creative, we're little creative geniuses in a way. And so he, um, he would never be able to find his key. And so she wouldn't let him in the house if he didn't have his key. And it was mean, you know, she was mean. And so I started to see this, but it again took me 10 years to leave her too. And uh, I started to sew keys in my son's jackets and everything, you know. It was interesting raising Nathaniel then because in elementary school, he was okay that I was a lesbian. But then as he grew, in, got into middle school and high school, things changed, you know, and he, he wanted to spend more time. Um, and his, his dad had very nice wives and so he was happy over there on weekends with them and so um yeah and so i used to do these lesbian things when nathaniel wasn't around yeah like have everybody over to my house and it was the center definitely at one point the center for every and i i was always in with a lot of jewish lesbians so they would all come to my house for christmas and they would all come you know, um, so they were another whole group, twice blessed, lesbian and Jewish, they used to call themselves. 
And so that was another group that I hung out with. And um, yeah, I feel like I'm I'm scattered at this point. Um, well, you, you said that you broke up with Alexa. I broke up with Alexa. Right. And then I met Bobby, and we've been together 23 years. Mm -hmm. And that's been a long and wonderful life together with her, sort of like grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, is true. And she's 82 and I'm 76. And she's very much very active and very, um, she, um, when she, she ran a theater with her ex-husband and um, they ran one of the first uh, lesbian theaters, uh, no, 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 first women, it was women's theater. During the women's movement, they had one of the longest running plays. The first play of the women's movement called How to Make a Woman was, and it ran in Harvard Square for many, many years. She's from Boston. And um, she was always an activist, but when she retired from theater work, she started to do, her daughter wrote a book called That Takes Ovaries, and she started to do activism and women em women's empowerment work. She did it in India with um, sex trafficked women to try to help them move out of the sex industry and into other lives. And she did this um, with her daughter, and it, it was called That Takes Ovaries. And then I joined them after I retired and did some of that work. Um, but anyway, once she turned 70, she started to do this work. And we have lived a very interesting life in San Francisco, just um, pursuing. It's interesting when you're in your 60s and 70s and you're a lesbian. It's, um, it's a wonderful life. Um, I, I love her. I love being with her. She is, we help one another, we inspire one another to be our creative selves. I left mathematics at the university. I took those numbers and I buried them as deep as I could get and everything else about being a math professor, a math education professor. And I started to go to City College and I became the artist I always knew I was. and. So I'm a painter now, and she encouraged that, and I encourage her and her theater work. She did a number of um, theater pieces in San Francisco, and I uh, worked with Terry Baum, who is one of the, our famous, uh, slight, she calls herself a slightly renowned, world famous lesbian uh, playwright. And she's very funny. She's a playwright and a comedian. Uh, in San Francisco, and Bobby has been her director for many years. And so we're involved in the development of our own creative lives as lesbians, and um, we live in a community where there are loads of gays and lesbians, 55-plus community, and we're a very much a part of these other people, this community, uh, figuring out who we are in this later part of our lives. They call it the um, fourth act of our lives, the third act of our lives, whatever you want to call it. And so we're um, constantly, we're still figuring out who we are as old lady lesbians. And we wanted to be mentors to younger lesbians, but they don't really, they want to figure out who they are themselves, which is, which is interesting. Um, and that's fine and that's, that's good, you know, um, because I don't know if we ever did figure out, but we love the word lesbian and we love carrying that name, uh, even if the younger um, women uh, don't want to carry that name, you know, we love it. And um, so Bobby and I constantly inspire one another. And, um, uh, but, but mostly as artists and as members of this community and 
as supporters of the of other um, gays and lesbians in this part of our lives, and um, and we've gone in and out of different stages because at one point we had these beautiful lesbian bars in San Francisco, and we don't have that anymore. Now the lesbians are having dinner parties, you know, <laughs> with their own <laughs> whatever. And or we're, we now we go out together or we so whatever we do, you know, but we do inspire one another to continue to be activists. And that's a big part of our our lesbian selves. And so that brings me to uh, something which I'd like to talk about. I don't know if we have time. Um, um, sure. I think we have a little bit of time left. right? Yeah. OK, so. Um, what I'm doing now is something which I think is wonderful, and um, it's that I'm working with the refugees on the island of Lesbos. It's spelled Lesvos, but it's said Lesbos because the V is the B sound in Greek. And um, Lesbos is the island where Sappho, the lesbian poet, was born. And so when the, when the big crisis hit, um, the refugee crisis, and people were leaving their homes and their lives and fleeing for their lives from Syria, Afghanistan, Africa, many, many, many places, Iraq, Iran, when they were leaving, Saudi Arabia, when they were leaving these places and they were making their way into Turkey, then they were saying, we've got to get to Europe, we've got to get to Greece, and they would go to Izmir, Turkey, and from there they would take these boats and they would land on the island of Lesbos. And so this was before the big political Hillary and Trump stuff, and so it was being covered by the news. And I was watching it. I had just retired from San Francisco State, and so I was watching, not just, but I was watching this... Um, whole scenario unfold in front of the television. I was saying, oh my God, they're going to Lesbos. I think all the lesbians should go over there and help these refugees. And I called all of my friends. I couldn't get a single person to go. I started off with all the lesbians. Any lesbian I knew in the whole world, I called them. And they were saying, you're crazy. You're going to be killed. It's dangerous. And it wasn't dangerous. These refugees aren't dangerous, certainly. And so when I first went, we were pulling people out of the water, and I went with Dirty Girls of Lesbos, and Dirty Girls of Lesbos is this big lesbian. Uh, her name is Alison Terry Evans. She's a lesbian from Australia. She was running this Dirty Girls of Lesbos. She was bringing all these women from, she put it on Facebook, and she got all these women to come over from all over the world to Lesbos. And so when I started, I saw this article in the New York Times about people going over and volunteering. And I said, I'm going to go. So I wrote to all the people that they listed. And she was the only one that got back to me. And she said, come on. I said, I don't have anyone to come with. She said, it doesn't matter. Come by yourself. You're going to meet people, all the people who are like you. They want to change the world. They want to help these people. And she said, do you have the money? I said, yeah, I get a pension. She said, what better way? <laughs> So that's what I'm doing. I'm volunteering. I went over there the first year and I worked with her. And then I said, I want to get into the refugee camps. And so the women at the hotel said to me, well, you've got to, do you know how to cook? I said, of course I know how to cook. And she said, well, you can go into the refugee camps as the cook. I know the cook. So I said, great, I'll go and cook. She said, well, you have to bring something, bring 50 loaves of bread. Fine. So I brought 50 loaves of bread. Meanwhile, I was writing to my friends, and they were coming over. So a group of, of us went, and we went in, and I, I went into the refugee camp. We started to cook with this guy who was cooking. And so then I saw these T-shirts walking around, red T-shirts, save the children. Save the children. Oh, my God, we're all teachers. We want to save the children. So I said, so I made my way to their trailer, and I said, hey, we're volunteers, we're cooking, but we're teachers. I just heard on the news that the kids don't have anything to do. 
She said, that's right. I said, we can teach them. And she said, you're kidding me. I said, no. I said, I've got these people. So we taught in the camps, in these horrible refugee camps. And so we taught. And then I went home after two months, and I started to get other people to come. We started to get retired teachers to come. And so we called ourselves, um, so basically, to make a long story short, I've been going now for the past three years. I've gone six times. I've gone two or three months at a time. And we've helped to develop a school called Gecko Kids School. It's a school for unaccompanied minors. And the second school now, that's more like a center, is called Tapawat Center, which means mothers and children in Native American. And so we're working in uh, a Tapawat Center and I'm, um, we're teaching. We had 11 retired teachers come this summer, many of whom are gays and lesbians, some are not. And we have this wonderful group of teachers coming to Lesbos, and we call ourselves REAL, REAL International Volunteers, Refugee Education and Learning, R-E-A-L. And so I feel like it's a gift to me. And I feel like Sappho is there for me the whole way. Everyone is there for me. God, the goddess, Sappho, Allah, Buddha, all these <laughs> spiritual people, they're guiding the way for me. And um, I feel like I'm, I'm doing this really wonderful piece of work now. And... Um, and other people are doing it with me, and I, f I feel very gifted to have been, at this last part of my life, given this very meaningful role to fulfill. And I guess that's it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> the end. I think that's a good place to, to stop, yeah.